Lately, a lot of attention has been placed on athletes making completely ridiculous claims about why they don't want to get the COVID vaccine. But it turns out some of the people who cover those athletes aren't much better. ESPN host Sage Deal has been removed from, from the air following her appearance on former NFL quarterback Jay Cutler's podcast. During the wide-ranging conversation, she made unsettling remarks about women's wardrobe choices, President Obama's race, and ESPN's vaccine mandate. Take a listen. When you dress like that, yeah. I'm not saying you deserve the gross comments, but you know what you're doing when you're putting that outfit on, too. Yeah. Like, women are smart, so don't play coy and put it all on the guys. If they make you choose a race, yeah. she's like, what are you going to put? I go, well, both. She's like, well, you can't. She goes, well, what if Barack Obama chose black and he's biracial? I'm like, well, congratulations to the president. That's his thing. I go, I think that's fascinating consider considering his black dad was nowhere to be found. I respect everyone's decision. I really yeah. do. Yeah. But to mandate it is um, sick. Mm -hmm. And it's scary yeah. to me in many ways. In a statement, still apologized for her, the controversy her comments caused. But her former colleague, Jamel Hill, summed up the situation by calling it, quote, clown behavior. And Jamel joins me now. She's a contributing writer for The Atlantic and host of the Jamel Hill is Unbothered podcast. Jamel, I honestly don't want to, I don't want this to be just like a moment where we're dunking on someone who said some wild things. Um, but I do want to talk about the danger of using your platform and harming people <laughs> and saying things that are harmful, dangerous, and wrong. Can you just speak to the issues of the misinformation about the vaccine, um, how it's harmful to essentially say black fathers aren't there so Barack Obama can't check black? I mean, there were some wild things there, but I think it's a lot about how you utilize your platform and that it's a privilege and you should be responsible with it. Yeah, I think that's a big part of it. And, you know, also, I think in terms of a, from a company standpoint, having worked at ESPN for 12 years, uh, as distasteful as many of the comments were, the ones I'm sure that they circled was what she said about the vaccine, because that's a direct criticism of company policy. And that usually does not go over very well with the people who write your check. <laughs> OK, um, as for the rest of it, I mean, I think the part that maybe she doesn't understand is harmful is we understand that people who are of mixed race, who have mixed parentage, that we're not asking you to choose and say, you love your white mom more than your black dad or your black dad more than your white mom or vice versa. What I think was the uh, dog whistle and what was the hurtful part for a lot of black people mm -hmm. watching that was that she made sure to use Obama's situation with his father to denigrate black people and to take a unnecessary shot at black men. And regardless of whether your parents are around or not, it doesn't change racially what you are. The fact is, and Obama even talked about this when he was in office, is he has been in elevators where white women have plucked their purses mm -hmm. and his mom is white, okay? So he understands <laughs> that he is viewed as a black man, much like even Clearly, she loves both her parents and is proud of, of both of their heritages and what they bring to the table. But when you look at Sage Steel, you see a black woman. And that's just kind of what it is. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, a, it's a funny point, but it's actually a point that I've made before. I think about it all the time because there's a, there's a lot of times where people are like, you know, you should identify this way or you should identify. People can identify however they want. No one's saying you're only allowed to check one box, right? As you said, you can love both of your parents. Nobody is saying that. But I think the utilization of the stereotype of black men, that is actually not true. It's not true, um, you know, was, was a cheap shot. I also want to talk about the comment about women, because it... You tweeted that when you hear the comment, it's actually worse than when you read it. And I, I agree with you on that, because as somebody who is a feminist and I, I care about rape culture and slut shaming, like, that's not great. <laughs> can, can you talk about, you know, how those comments are also harmful, just as harmful as the misinformation about the vaccine and black men? I mean, slut shaming women for how they choose to dress and present themselves in public um, 
Why can't we stop doing that to each other, <laughs> fellow women? <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I guess that's the part that, um, you know, is probably disappointing, especially considering that for, for many years, um, Sage was essentially the headliner at the ESPN Women's Summit. And so somebody that a lot of young ladies, a lot of younger journalists, female journalists look up to, they revere, uh, they look at her career and they want to emulate that. And the idea that she would be telling um, any of them that she didn't want to be associated with them because of how they presented themselves, I'd be very curious as about what about their presentation was it? Because everybody's line is different. And, you know, I'll be totally candid while working there. I have heard her say certain comments about on-air talent that are women in terms of her criticizing what they dress like. And I can tell you, certainly, that it, it, I mean, they weren't out there wearing something that would elicit that kind of criticism. It might have just been mm. across her personal line, but that didn't mean in any way that what they were doing were impro uh, was inappropriate. And sometimes, um, as women, as Black people, it works the same way. We have to be careful not to do the work of the patriarchy and of white supremacy. Mm. Like, we got to stop carrying water. White supremacy and patriarchy, they don't need no help, all right? And so um, what you do when you say make comments like that is that you allow those men in those environments to not take women seriously. You give them the license because mm -hmm. they heard it from another woman that their mm -hmm. behavior is okay. I don't care what a woman is wearing. It does not give you the license to harass her, to belittle her, to um, sexualize her. It doesn't. And when we continue to have this narrative that it's somehow a woman's responsibility to um, to have the, it's our responsibility to, for, in terms of how men behave, then we're losing. You know, it's just like, this is a mm -hmm. part of the culture, the rape culture that has been allowed to persist mm -hmm. much too long because they, they keep telling us that we have to dress a certain way or look a certain way. I would love for somebody to present what that is because there's plenty of women who are fully, wholly clothed from top to bottom who were the victims of assault, rape and harassment. Okay, so it's not about what you wear. It's about the fact that somebody has decided to rape and harass you and to hear another woman um, sort of picking at low hanging fruit and undoing some of the things that we're trying to reteach our young men and adult men as well. That is extremely harmful. I mean, internalized misogyny, which is, is what you're speaking about there, and, and, and that internalization of the messages that if you dress a certain way, you'll be respected is a lie. That is a lie of the patriarchy. I grew up in a household where my mother was like, cross your legs a certain way, your skirt needs to be a certain length, and I, I was sexually assaulted. It didn't have anything to do with my outfit. It had to do with the choice of the person who sexually assaulted me. So, you know, I think women put forward that argument because it makes them feel safe. They're like, well, I won't do those things that that woman did that, you know, got her assaulted. And the truth is, there isn't anything you could do. And it's a scary reality, but it is the truth. Um, one of the other things I wanted to talk about as well with you, Jamila, is just this idea that we're in this pandemic. There's, we were just talking about Facebook misinformation. You have um, really the sort of the remnants of the Trump era that's like infected our uh, electorate. Um, and then you have folks who have platforms and it's rare. It's not every day that there's a black woman with um, who is an anchor or a host um, on a show or a channel like ESPN. So, so I want to go back to the point I started with, which is the responsibility when you have a platform. Can you just talk about the ways in which you've utilized your platform to educate people on many of these issues? Because that is critically important these days. There's not enough people doing that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I consider it... Um you know, my responsibility, and I hope people don't interpret that as me thinking it's a burden, because it's not. I think it is, um, it, it's the least that I could do. And the coronavirus, as you report on every night, has devastated our community. I have lost two people mm -hmm. um, to the virus personally. I know a lot of my friends have lost um, their loved ones, or at least have seen many of them um, infected and sick from this disease. And so, it, there needs to be a sense of community responsibility. And I have tried to use my platform in a way to not just educate, but to inform. I did an entire podcast um, in conjunction with LeBron James's uh, organization, More Than a Vote, talking to the leading black health experts and officials uh, so that we can combat a lot of this misinformation that's out there. I understand people being mm -hmm. scared. Um, I understand people being hesitant. 
I'm afraid of needles. I don't like them either, right? <laughs> so I, I get it. I understand that. And I think that's okay. What is much more bothersome for me, irritating for me, is when the people who do have these large platforms use it to not just espouse misinformation, but to be selectively, um, you know, just to have selective outrage about certain things. I mean, you look at the NBA stars mm. that are resisting the vaccine. All of them have to get a vaccine or immunizations to play sports. All of them. Right. You cannot play sports in this country without it. So I don't know why we're suddenly acting like these vaccine mandates are a reinstallment of Jim Crow. That's not what's happening here. It's a public <laughs> health issue. And you do do it. Say still, she had a choice. She could miss that check right. and not be vaccinated. Right. That's not what she chose right. to do. And so I think at the very least, um, we have a responsibility as, as, as people of color in a right. position that we're in to communicate effectively with our community. It's so, so true. And, and stick to the facts. That's what I say. Jamel Hill, thank you so much for being here tonight, as always. Hi, I'm Zerlina Maxwell. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more from Zerlina by clicking any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thanks for watching.